surprise, it's me. Ha <laughs> ha ha. Yes. We call these impromptu live streams. Good evening. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is Mythical Ireland. And tonight we are doing an unscheduled book talk. There'll be lots of these. Uh, as part of the effort to <clears throat> uh, distract ourselves from the ongoing uh, pandemic, um, there's no point having a library of books behind me if we're not willing to discuss some of them. And as you know, <laughs> I love books and I love talking about them. Hope you're all keeping safe and well. Only a day since we did a live stream. So I thought I'd do another one. And tonight's topic, of course, as revealed in the title of the live stream, is the landmark book by Thomas Cahill that is called, quite cleverly, How the Irish Saved Civilization. And uh, so this is a book that has been reprinted many times. I think it was originally published in 1995 and has garnered a lot of attention. And you'll see lots of copies of it in bookshops, new and secondhand bookshops. Anyway, a brief chat tonight. Um, not intending to stay on for an hour, but you never know because this is the way these things tend to happen. I have no plan. I'm just going to talk a little bit about it uh, and uh, a little bit of a surprise, perhaps, also uh, thrown in. So hello on YouTube. And I didn't pre-publicize this or what's the word? I didn't uh, pre-schedule this on YouTube. So uh, Charlene Cosby is is uh, on YouTube and says hello. Hello, Charlene Daisy Peter says hi, Anthony. And all a very beautiful night to you. Thank you indeed. Charlene saying she missed the live stream. I presume you're talking about last night's live stream. That's okay. Uh, they're all saved for future watching. It was almost in my bed, says Alistair McKinnon. <laughs> Good. Well, we kept you from that for a little longer, hopefully. Stephen Walker says, you are one kind of addict I can get behind, Anthony. <laughs> yeah, I know. Look, I want to confess, I do have an addiction. An addiction to printed material. Anyway, uh, Tina Trana is the first of the commenters on Facebook, says, much love to our brilliant stuff. Jules Cousins is in the house. Hello, Jules. Richard Landrialt says, hello, it's me, Richard. Remember me? Mm. Curiously, I don't. Perhaps you might give me a hint as to where I met you. Richard, it's good to see you. Mariana Dunn says, nice surprise this evening, Anthony. Yes, uh, more than one surprise, I hope. Kristen Grey Taggart says, hello, to a This book is on my to-be-read list already, so I'm interested to hear about it. Rene Andres is saying hello. Hello, Rene. Emka Hlavova says, Fosco, Fosco, I'm finally able to catch the live stream. Brilliant. Welcome along, MK. You're very thoughtful to roar. Dave Congdon says, I love this book. I've given copies to several friends. Brilliant. Donna Jean Porter says, hello. And indeed, the same to you, Donna Jean. Jules Cousins, the link, the links and photos of Nouth are incredible. Thank you. Yes, uh, I started a Nouth craze today and I will continue it because there's more material there. So keep an eye out for that. We'll keep that up over the next day or two. Kristen Murray Andre says, what a surprise and treat. Well, I'm glad you think so. <laughs> and uh, welcome along. Bianca Fashel says, good evening. Uh, How old is the Irish civilization? Well, at least uh, since about 9,000 years ago, since about 7,000 BC that we know of. Lynette McEnany. Hello, Lynette. Says, first time here. Looking forward to it. Good evening. Lynette is one of our locals here in Drogheda. Brady Tussie says, hi. Hey, Anthony, so glad to make it for this episode. Great surprise. Elaine Ding Dint, sorry. Elaine Dent Lingenfelter says, hi, Anthony. Nice surprise. Joe Kraus says, good morning from Melbourne, Australia. Hello. Happy Wednesday morning to you, Joe, from us in Tuesday night uh, here in the Boyne Valley. Emka, Emka. Ah, yes, hello indeed. Susan Long says, good evening. Falcha. James Perry says, good evening. From County Down, Slauncha, James. Good to see you. Vicky Wallace Southerl is in the house. Not sure if Evan and Chili are there, but if they are, hello. Joe Butler says, lovely surprise to be with the Tua today. Sandy McNabb on YouTube says, good evening, sir. Charlene Cosby says, I love surprises. Good. So uh, how the Irish saved civilization is an interesting thesis. Uh, it's a little bit controversial, but not that controversial. Uh, those who have read it, uh, 
are impressed by it. Hello, Chili and Evan. Hello, welcome. Um, and so there's a little bit of a follow on here from Live Irishman's episode 119, which we streamed last week and which you'll be able to find on the YouTube channel. Remember, if you're watching on YouTube and you're not subscribed, subscribe to the channel for lots of stuff like this. Um, we were talking about scribes and kings. We were talking about the relationship between the Christian monks who wrote a lot of the Irish pre-Christian pagan mythology down on their manuscripts and the relationship between those and the kings and the rulers and how complex that was and how that might help to explain uh, why it is that a lot of, as I say, pagan uh, pre-Christian mythology was written down in the scriptoria of Irish monasteries in the Middle Ages. Philip Walsh says, good evening from Birmingham. Hello, Philip. René Andres Engage. Hello. Mer Marie, sorry, Mercy at Rouen is in Virginia in the USA and says, hi. Good evening. Good night. Good afternoon. Good afternoon indeed to you, Mercia. Um, and so that whole sort of complex interrelation of Christian monks, scribes, abbots, uh, later uh, bishops, etc., and the kings uh, and rulers of the time is, is a fascinating one. Of course, part of the reason the kings wanted books written in the first place was because they wanted to concrete their lineage and prove connections, in some cases, uh, to biblical storylines uh, and to prove the antique, um, the antique nature, the, the very um, ancient nature uh, and lineage of their family lines. Uh, Bernie Courtney says, good evening. They wanted to trace the lineage of their lines. Anthony, come on, you've got to come up with better wor wordage than that. Uh, and so we saw in that episode, in quite a lengthy episode, and of course that is um, the subject of a very long read blog post on the Mythical Ireland website. And just in case you haven't read it or seen it, I will paste that in here as a link, as a comment uh, beneath the live stream here so that perhaps afterwards you can get a chance to read that and read about those complexities, you know, because it's a question that a lot of people have asked. How, why, more importantly, why did Irish monks who were Christians write down what was ostensibly pagan uh, mythology that should have been anathema to them? Bernie Courtney says, good evening. Hello, Bernie. Welcome back. Paul Maguire says, hello from... Letter Kenny, Falsha Paul in Kondi Dunmagal. Uh, Stacy Renee Harris is in Maine in the USA and says hello, Falsha. Paul Campbell, impromptu means done without being planned or rehearsed. Yes, indeed. Paul Campbell in Galway City. No planning and no rehearsal. I just said, Asher, ah, sure, look, it's sitting there. I'll talk about it. Christine Murphy is in Maine and says hello, Falsha. Christine, always a great pleasure to welcome another Murphy into Chach Warku. Who was the Dermot, Anthony? I heard he was one of the kings. Uh, uh, there are a few. Uh, you're probably thinking of Dermot McMorrow, who was the one who uh, who brought the um, the Normans in. Uh, he promised, was it the Earl of Pembroke, uh, his daughter's hand in marriage. If he came back to Ireland and helped him with a few battles, the Earl of Pembroke came back. Uh, what was his name? Uh, De Verdon, wasn't it? Um, was it De Verdon? Um, Strongbow. And of course, the rest is to say is history. Uh, <laughs> they did more than take part in a battle. They kind of took over the place eventually. Um, and there's a few more uh, kings called Dermot, I'm pretty sure. High Maine people. My grandparents were from Maine. Uh, sorry, High Maine. There was a fa uh, wasn't there. There wasn't a clan called E, e Maine or High Maine. Uh, f ironically enough. Sorry, where was I? Uh, I was talking about the complexities. Yes, 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 yes. Anyway, uh, let's read a little bit uh, from the cover of the book to give you an introduction. I'm not going to read the book, but I will read a small segment. Uh, as always, with these live streams, I want to read enough to give you a flavour of the book, uh, but not enough to breach copyright. And in Irish copyright law, uh, we have what's called a fair use clause, and I'm not sure. Richard Fitzgilbert declare, not de Verdun, declare. Thank you, uh, Philip Walsh, for... Uh, correcting me on my mistake. Um, always good to know that I'm human and I make mistakes. Uh, always very glad to have them corrected as well, by the way. Um, 
So uh, I will read uh, enough to keep us within the fair use uh, clause. I'm not sure if the fair use clause is present in other countries' copyright laws, but I think it's a good one uh, because it, it means, uh, like, for instance, when you publish a book, when you read a book, you'll always see inside, you know, no part of this publication may be reproduced without the permission of the publisher and the author or whatever. But we have a fair use clause, which means, yeah, you can actually quote a few sections from the book without getting yourself into trouble, because without that, things would be very, very restrictive, you know. Blahi Nagyularua says, love the Aaron, Anthony. Yes, I was sporting it last night as well. Uh, the fact that we're coming into the winter time uh, means it's it's a probably a good time of, of year. By the way, another book that I picked up today, uh, and I'm not going to talk about tonight, but I might as well mention it. Um, is a guy who has a jumper that appears to be quite identical to mine. Um, and it, it, the book is called An Aaron Keening, sorry, An Aaron Keening, uh, about a guy who um, left his job and his girlfriend in Wales and travelled to Inishmore on the Aran Islands and stayed for 11 months alone in a tiny house. And this is a memoir of his time on the island. And there's a picture of him. And look, he's wearing a very, very similar Aaron jumper to mine. So anyway, that's a book. Uh, if I get a chance to read it, I might talk about it in another of our book talks at some point. Uh, Todd Despera says, good evening, Anthony. Hello, Todd. Unexpected uh, live stream or impromptu. On Lucht Boyne, 14 viewers, only five likes. Not reflective of the high quality of the work. I don't worry about it. I'm not here for the likes. I know that those who are meant to see these things will see these things. And I love the interactions anyway. Sylvia Sanchez says, OMG, I didn't know you're online. Well, you're watching now. and We've only just started. And as I said, I didn't pre, uh, I, I didn't uh, pre announce the live stream on YouTube that I, as I normally would, but not to worry. Owen Hickey says, unlooked. There was about 65 currently viewing on Facebook. Yeah. Bookworm, new to the channel. Really good. Good stuff, Bookworm. You're very welcome along. Uh, so I should introduce you to uh, what we call the live Irish myths, Tua. And uh, Tua is an Irish word for a clan or a family. And uh, we, we've been gathering since the beginning of the pandemic in March. Uh, we were doing daily live streams and they went weekly after 102 episodes. But I'm doing more impromptu stuff now. And there'll be a lot of book talks because there's a lot of books on the shelves here. And there's a lot of books that we want to talk about. <laughs> I thought you meant Val Dunigan. Uh, Veronica Casey says hello there, I fault you. Kristen Gray Taggart. We have fair use in the US. It's 20% for educational purposes, I think. Yeah, a good, a good idea to have it. A really good idea, I think. Uh, Margaret Kiernan, Night Owl Anthony. Is it all the moons? <laughs> I don't know. Our talk of constellations last night, perhaps. I got a good sleep last night. I have a question. Decades ago, I just caught the tail end of a Christian show and they said something about King David of Israel visiting Ireland and left one of his thrones there. Is that true? What is the story, if it is, and where is it? Oh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, dear. Uh, Terry, that is highly likely to be what we call folklore uh, and it's not, uh, I, I don't think there's any truth to it. There is a movement of people who believe that the biblical prophet Jeremiah came to Ireland uh, and that, in fact, he was buried here. Uh, but I can tell you there are political agendas behind those claims, so always be very careful of them. Mary Burgess says hello and good evening. Falcha, Mary. James Walsh is watching, none other than my cousin, James. Good to see you. Rene and Andy says yes. So many books to talk about. Too many till the end of time. Mm, well, sure, look, we'll keep it going, you know. Ireland played, this is from the cover of the book, Ireland played the central role in maintaining European culture when the Dark Ages settled on Europe in the 5th century. As Rome was sacked by Visigoths and its empire collapsed, Ireland became, quote, the Isle of Saints and Scholars, unquote, that enabled the classical and religious heritage to be saved. Linda Moore is in the house, says, late to the live stream, Jiriv Tua read the Power of Myth transcripts last night, all pumped, brilliant stuff. Uh, and I, oh, yeah, um, Asher, look, we might as well. Asher, look, we might as well show it. The Power of Myth, Joseph Campbell with uh, Bill Moyers. I think Bill Moyers is still alive, isn't he? Joseph Campbell, what an incredible human being. Linda Jones says, hi from Australia. Another viewer who is in Wednesday morning. Hello to all our Australian friends. Linda, you're very welcome along. Dolmac McDermott says, sweet pea. <laughs> Hello, Dolmac, welcome along. Susan Weathersby Dion says, love to this book. Well, 
I hope you did. Uh, Kelly Minich is watching. And there's a person who's signing as New Grange on YouTube who says, watching from here in Gettysburg in the USA, used to live in Screen. Brilliant stuff. Well, do you know, Gettysburg is one of the most haunted places in the States, apparently. There you go. And the Woodsies say bedtime, Anto, tomorrow. Yeah, catch up tomorrow. We'll say hello to you now anyway. Liam Ward is saying good morning from Brisbane. It looks like half of Australia is joining uh, the book talk here on Live Irish Myths. Liam, great to see you. A very good morning to you. In his compelling and entertaining narrative, Thomas Cahill tells the story of how Irish monks and scribes copied the manuscripts of both pagan and Christian writers, including Homer and Aristotle, while libraries on the continent were lost forever. Bringing the past and its characters to life, Cahill captures the sensibility of the unsung Irish who relaunched civilization. Terry says, thank you for answering. That is why I prefer to ask the indigenous people about their history instead of just believing what someone else says about them. Uh, always good to get it from as many sources as possible. Hibernia 63 says, good morning from the Czech Republic. Good morning, indeed. You're very welcome along on YouTube. Pardon me. And here are some reviews of said book. How the Irish Saved Civilization is a shamelessly engaging, effortlessly scholarly, utterly refreshing history of the origins of the Irish soul and its huge contribution to Western culture. For its portrait of St. Patrick alone, it will resonate in the memory. And that's by Thomas Keneally. Lyrical, playful, penetrating and serious. An entirely engaging, delectable voyage into the distant past. A small treasure, says Richard Bernstein in the New York Times. Well, I disagree. I don't think it's a small treasure. I think it's a very big one. Bianca Fashel says, what an amazing book, The Power of Myth. You're not wrong. And whether legally or not, I have to be careful. I think that quite a lot of The Power of Myth interviews with uh, Bill Moyers and Joseph Campbell are on YouTube. I didn't tell you that. Tom King is watching Falchit Tom on Gawa. Connors at all too. Candace Hamilton Bohonic says, loved this book. Fascinating. You see a lot of people liked it. And J.P. Kavanagh writing in the Sunday Telegraph says, this sweepingly confident overview is more entertainingly told than any previous account. An elegant book. Thomas Cahill is the author of A Literary Guide to Ireland, author of Jesus' Little Instruction Book, and a publisher with a leading New York firm. He is married and has two children. Of course, that was in 1995. I don't know uh, uh, what has become of him in the intervening period. Perhaps someone might tell us. Janet Moran is saying hello from Boston. Hello and good afternoon, Janet. Mark Warfel says hi from the US. Hello, Mark. A very good evening to you. Welcome along to our book talk. Ah, yes. So uh, I'll just give you an idea of, because again, I don't want to read uh, sections of it. It begins with a quote, <clears throat> which is interesting. Nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. Nothing which is true or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. Therefore, we must be saved by faith. Nothing we do, however virtuous, can be accomplished alone. Therefore, we must be saved by love. And that's by Reinhold uh, uh, Neighbour. First published by Hodder and Stoughton in 1995. And the order of chapters is, uh, I'll just read out this. I am going to read a small section, a small excerpt. The introduction is, how real is history? And then comes chapter one, the end of the world, how Rome fell and why? Chapter two, what was lost? The complexities of the classical tradition. Three, a shifting world of darkness, unholy Ireland. Four, Good news from far off, the first missionary. Five, a solid world of light, holy Ireland. Bill Moyers is 86 years young, says Linda. Brilliant. Six is what was found, how the Irish saved civilization. Seven, the end of the world. Is there any hope? And the rest is a pronunciation guide to Irish, key Irish words, biographical sources, chronology, acknowledgements, index, etc. Ah, so we'll read an excerpt so you can get a little bit of a, a, 
a, a taste of what is within its covers. Shalene Ward says, morning from sunny Brisbane. Absolutely. The whole of Australia is watching. A very good morning. A happy Wednesday morning to you and all our Australian viewers from uh, Tuesday evening in the Boyne Valley. Peter Moore says, draw had a man living in Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Canada. Love all your talks. Brilliant stuff, Peter. There's a former mayor of Drogheda. You'll probably know this, uh, Peter Moore. A very, very, very famous mayor of Drogheda uh, who was mayor when I was a youngster. The late uh, Peter Moore. Good. So Todd says, a lot of great works by Joseph Campbell. Yes, indeed. I have a Joseph Campbell section on my bookshelf. If you're into mythology, you, you cannot be without something by Joseph Campbell and something by uh, C.G. Young as well, by the way. The Irish did not especially mean to be deviant, but their world hardly abounded in models of Christian orthodoxy. And of course, we touched on that, the introduction to that long read blog post, which was the, the basis of episode 119 of Live Irish Myths, when I said that they were a little bit they suffered from heterodoxy, if you could say. Uh, ostensibly, they were Christian monks. Uh, but a lot of them, of course, uh, derived from uh, the uh, pre-Christian uh, Druidic tradition uh, and the tradition of the Philly or the Phila, the poets. Uh, and it was a little bit hard for them to shake all that off uh, while practicing Christianity at the same time. Miriam McTeera says, Gia Glitch, Anthony. Conosatotu, nice to finally catch alive again. Brilliant stuff, Miriam. You're welcome along. Fall to Roa. Sit down, take a seat. Alan Watts, too, says Dolmac, of course. Yes, indeed. There's a couple of uh, Alan Watts books. Mircea Iliadi, I would put in that category as well. Not forgetting. Um, yes, indeed. I'm sorry. I read one sentence and then got diverted. After Patrick, they experienced an influx of anchorites and monks fleeing before the barbarian hordes. And these, no doubt, provided them with some finer points on eremitical and uh, conventual life. Uh, quote, all the learned men on this side of the sea, unquote, claims a note in a laden manuscript of this time. Quote, again, took flight for transmarine places like Ireland, bringing about a great increase of learning, unquote, and doubtlessly a spectacular increase in the number of books like that to the inhabitants of those regions. But not a few of these men were bone-thin ascetics from such Roman hinterlands as Armenia, Syria, and the Egyptian desert. The Ulster Monastery of Bangor, for instance, claimed in its litany to be ex Egypto transducta, in English, translated from Egypt, and the convention of using red dots to adorn manuscript initials, a convention that soon became a mark of Irish manuscripts, had first been glimpsed by the Irish in books that the fleeing Copts brought with them. By the way, on that point, we will do an entire episode uh, of uh, book, book talk about Bob Quinn's The Atlantean Irish. So that will be one uh, coming soon. Uh, again, touching on some of these themes. Uh, another very controversial piece of work, but one much loved by those who have read it, by and large. The steely zealotry and peculiar practices of such men had already merited the suspicion of orthodox bishops on the continent, who much preferred the rule of St. Martin of Gaul, whose foundations were all alike and readily subservient to the desires of the local bishop. Soon they would find even greater virtue in the rule of Benedict of Nursia, whose foundation at Monte Cassino would become in time the mother house of Western monasticism, a monasticism of disciplined uniformity enforced through floggings, if necessary, by an autocratic abbot. Blessed by successive popes, the rule of St. Benedict would in the end obliterate all mem memory of the pluriform Irish. Wonderful uh, uh, grammar. Uh, Dolmac, I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about when you say grammar, but there is some wonderful grammar in this work. To the Irish, the Pope 
the Bishop of Rome, who was successor to St. Peter, was a kind of high king of the church. But like the high king, a distant figure whose wishes were little known and less considered. Rome was surely the ultimate pilgrim's destination, especially because there were books there that could be brought back and copied, exclamation mark. But if your motive was holiness, and this is a quote, to go to Rome is little profit, profit, P-R-O-F-I-T, to go to Rome is little profit, endless pain. The master that you seek in Rome, you find at home or seek in vain. Wonderful stuff. The Western Empire was scarcely a memory now. The last Latin emperor had fallen just a few years after Patrick died. And I think that was Augustine. Augustine, uh, And I think there's a chapter uh, about that. And though there was still a Greek emperor in the east at Constantinople, where a small defensible state was long established on the Bosporus, he might as well have been a Timbuktu, for all his law was known in Western lands. Desiree Riley is in the house, says, hey, impromptu episode, yay. Hi, Anthony and everyone. It is a beautiful afternoon in Louisiana. Spread the joy, spread the good weather, Desiree. Welcome along to Book Talk uh, on Live Irish Myths. The separation, according to Des Mackenzie Harris, the separation of Latin words in sentences to allow easier reading was an Irish development. There you go. Sandy McNabb says, what did the Romans ever do for us? Uh, the aqueduct. Sorry? Uh, the aqueduct. Oh, yes. Well, obviously the aqueduct. But I mean, part of the aqueduct, what do they ever do? Sanitation? Education? The roads? <laughs> ah, yes. Brilliant. Hey, where was I? <laughs> All the great continental libraries had vanished. Even memory of them had been erased from the minds of those who lived in the emerging feudal societies of medieval Europe. The first three public libraries had been established at Rome under the reign of Augustus. Sorry, was it Augustine or Augustus? I may have got that wrong. I apologize. And the time of Constantine were there were sorry, and by the time of Constantine, there were 28. By the end of the 4th century, if we are to believe one writer, Ammianus Marcel Mar Marcellinus, who may be indulging in hyperbole, Bibliothecus sepulchrorum ritu in perpetuum clausis, which means in English, if your Latin is good, you'll know what it means, but I'm, my Latin isn't very good because we didn't learn it in school. The libraries, like tombs, were closed forever. By the end of the 5th century, at any rate, the profession of copyist had pretty much disappeared. And what books were copied were copied personally by the last literate nobles for their own dwindling libraries. And remember, of course, that at this point in, in Ireland, in, in, in the 4th and the 5th century in Ireland, uh, we didn't have the first uh, written uh, manuscripts. Uh, we were still remembering everything by word of mouth. And of course, the training of the Phila and the Bards and the Olives uh, was, was, was so rigorous that, in fact, they had to spend years learning and had to learn off entire tracts of mythical lore uh, from heart, by heart, uh, from memory, uh, before they could ever be considered to be a poet. Adina Sparks is in the house, says, Afternoon all, what a treat. Glad to have you along, Adina. Welcome. Uh, Nicholas of Wailon says, Conus atana tua galera nocht o conde fort larga. How are the tua tonight, all of the tua tonight from County Waterford? Am I right? Oh, jeez, Anthony. I've had just had a mental block. I'm not, I swear I'm not Googling it, Waterford. Oh, crikey. <laughs> <laughs> I had a severe moment of doubt there from for, us, for more than a moment, actually. That was just between us. I'm going to cut that out of the edited version. <laughs> In the 6th century, Pope Gregory established a kind of library at Rome. Gregory, the most towering continental figure of his time, and rightly called the Great, 
took as, as dim a view of the pagan classics as Aldhelm, who could read no Greek. His library was a poor one. Even so, the resentful, illiterate mob tried to destroy its few books during a famine, for by now the Catholic bishops had become like islands in a barbarian sea. In Italy and Gaul, some book trading continued, much of it with wandering Irish monks. And by century's end, Isidore was building a real library in Seville, or Sevilla, which consisted of about 15 presses or book cabinets, containing perhaps some 400 bound codices, an amazing number for the time. The only other continental library, other people are prompting me, say Waterford. Oh, geez, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, Karen Fay O'Loughlin says, oh, goody, just stumbled upon this. Brilliant. I will have to leave. Uh, I have a doctor's appointment, says Joe Krause. Glad I got to be part of the surprise. Looking forward to catching up later. Good stuff, Joe. Good luck with the appointment. And we'll see you later. Alan Hoskins is in the house from uh, the, the vicinity of Bale Boru on the Shannon uh, and says, good to see you. And as a, it is a pleasure to see you, Alan, also. Education was also free to all in Ireland at the time, uh, says Des Mackenzie Harris. Yes, we also allegedly have um, uh, we also allegedly have free education, but I'm not convinced because I had to pay my son's school fees the other day. Not at all convinced that it's free. The only other continental library known to us in this period was in Calabria at Cassiodorus's monkish estate, which he called Vivarium. But the fate of this library is lost in the blood and smoke of the 6th century. Gregory of Tours wrote this sad epitaph on 6th century literary, li literacy. Quote, in these times when the practice of letters declines, no, rather perishes in the cities of Gaul, there has been found no scholar trained in ordered composition to present in prose or verse a picture of things which have befallen, unquote. I should say that a similar fate uh, pre was presented here in the 10th century, and I think I've mentioned this before, there are no surviving manuscripts from the 10th century from our monasteries. And the reason for that is because of the bloody mayhem that there was here and the internecine uh, warfare between the provincial kings and the Vikings. Uh, between the kings and themselves, between the kings and the Vikings, between kings al allied with Vikings fighting other kings, uh, and in some cases, kings allied with Vikings fighting against other Irish kings al allied with other Vikings. <laughs> Complex scenario. But we're very glad to say that we have a significant corpus of mythology, a lot of which was saved by those self-same Christian monks. Sharon McRae says, hi from Tyrone. Good stuff, Sharon. Uh, on Chiaron, uh, Falche. O Gondelu, O Drehid Aha, Anucht. Ireland at peace and furiously copying, thus stood in the position of becoming Europe's publisher. And the reason I wanted to read this section was because I think this is a central tenet. It is a, a, a pillar, a major pillar on which Thomas Cahill's uh, thesis stands. That when everything else was um, declining, perishing in the blood and smoke uh, of uh, uh, what was going on in the Dark Ages, uh, Ireland stood uh, in the position of becoming Europe's publisher. But the pagan Saxon settlements of southern England had cut Ireland off from easy commerce with the continent. Consider that a kind of a Brexit because we're facing the situation now where it's going to be a little bit more difficult for us to do business uh, with not just our friends in Britain, but also on the continent. <laughs> Somebody was suggesting that uh, the port of Rosslare uh, on the southeastern tip of Ireland could become very important again as a means of sending product and, of course, receiving it uh, to and from the European continent while bypassing our friends on uh, the island uh, to the east of us. Patricia Healy Sullivan is in the house, says hello to her from Vermont with love. Graw more earth. Uh, Patricia August uh, Falche Guji uh, on Lowerlin Show. Welcome to this library. Uh, August on uh, on Circle. We could call it a circle, couldn't we? Our Tua uh, Anucht. Our family, our clan tonight. 
While Rome and its ancient empire faded from memory and a new illiterate Europe rose on its ruins, a vibrant literary culture was blooming in secret along its Celtic fringe. And there in that paragraph uh, is uh, the central uh, tenet, as I say, the pillar upon which Cahill's thesis stands. It needed only one step more to close the circle which would reconnect Europe to its own past by way of scribal Ireland. And I'm not going to read much more because I'm conscious of the fair use. Colum Kill provide, provided that step. By stepping into the coracle that bore him beyond the horizon, he entered the, uh, the Irish pantheon of heroes who had done immortal deeds against impossible odds. As he sailed off that morning, he was doing the hardest thing an Irish man could do, a much harder thing than giving up his life. He was leaving Ireland. Isn't that such a... Uh, that sentence is filled with pathos and, and it is it rings so true. He was emigrating and uh, Cahill is saying here that uh, leaving Ireland is, is almost a harder thing to do uh, than dying, than giving up your life. And of course, it's a fate that befell so many Irish people throughout the centuries. If the green martyrdom had failed, here was a martyrdom that was surely the equal of the red. And henceforth, all who followed Column Kill's lead were called to the white martyrdom. They who sailed into the white sky of morning, into the unknown, never to return. In this way, the Irish monastic tradition began to spread beyond Ireland. Already the Irish monasteries had hosted many thousands of foreign students who were bringing back Irish learning to their places of origin. Now Irish monks would themselves colonise barbarised Europe, bringing their learning with them. Scotland, their first outpost, was peopled by indigenous Picts and Irish colonists who had already established themselves in Patrick's time. Never interested in, in impressive edifices, Irish monks preferred to spend their time in study, prayer, farming, and of course, copying. And I'm glad that he uses the word copying and not plagiarism. <laughs> so the basic plan of the Iona Monastery was quickly executed. A little hut for each monk, an abbot's hut, somewhat larger and on higher ground, a refectory and kitchen, a scriptorium and library. And here is the scriptorium and the library of mythical Ireland. A smithy. There you go, Tom King. A killen, a mill, and a couple of barns. And that's barns, B-A-R-N-S, not bars. <laughs> a modest church. And they were in business. Soon they found they needed one more building. The surprising addition of a guest house. For the never-ending stream of visitors had begun. Scots, Picts, Irish, Britons, even Anglo-Saxons, attracted by the reputation of their larger-than-life abbot of Iona, which is um, brilliant, uh, really. Beer, says Dolmac McDermott, meditation to... So, uh, I want to read. So, just to, that's uh, the... Uh, I've lost the word. I had it a moment ago. Um, that is the excerpt, yes, indeed, that I was going to read from Thomas Cahill's How the Irish Saved Civilization. So I'm going to read uh, from uh, a, a blog post uh, that asks the question, did the Irish really save civilization? Uh, and this is published on uh, uh, McGill blogs. So just to give you an idea that not everybody is absolutely fawning in their praise of Cahill's work. But as I said, most people who read it at the very least enjoy it, even if they're not completely convinced by the thesis. I think it's a fairly decent thesis myself. Uh, Cahill's book is an interesting chronicle of the role of the Irish. The island of saints and scholars uniquely played as conservators and shapes shapers of the medieval civilization and mind. Cahill argues that although retrospectively history often appears to be just one catastrophe after another, simply synthesizing a narrative of human pain, 
That history is also a narrative of grace. Precisely, history is also the, quote, recountings of those blessed and inexplicable moments when someone did something for someone else, gave something beyond what was required of the circumstances, unquote. Eamon O'Brien is in the house, says, Hi, Anthony, great listening here in my workshop, starting the night shift, Goro Mahagut, Eamon O'Brien Jewellery. Brilliant stuff, Eamon, and I hope that you are inspired to uh, some fabulous creations. Working within this perspective, Cahill ventures to display that it was the Irish after the fall of the Roman Empire, which took up this valiant position to service of service to all, exemplifying this narrative of grace. He tries to show that the Irish were essen essentially great gift givers. Do you know what? So much of this rings true because the Irish, until recently, were the uh, uh, they were ranked number one in the world, the, uh, Ireland. Uh, as the country which gives the most charity. Uh, that arrived on the scene in a time of crisis, aiding in the transition and transformation of civilization. And of course, we are well known through Christianity, by and large, it has to be said, but we are well known for sending missionaries abroad to help those less fortunate than ourselves. Yes, we were proselytizing at the same time. We were trying to convert people to Christianity, but fundamentally helping them uh, uh, to survive the ravages and the harshness uh, of um, mm -hmm, uh, famine, war, uh, conflict, uh, and and other uh, natural uh, and human uh, uh, man-made disasters. Rather than undertaking a conventional his historical endeavor of examining a static historical occurrence, he attempts to examine a history in movement, the transition from the fall of Rome to the Dark Ages through the lens of the Irish. Well, history is not a static thing, isn't it not? It is a constantly evolving narrative. This work puts forward quite an interesting and, th and strong thesis, but Cahill fails to proportionately support and defend such a bold thesis. Cahill's thesis revolves around the idea that the evangelization of Ireland through St. Patrick, Ireland had become a hotbed of monasticism and thus a centre of learning and literacy. Ireland's historical openness and interest in competing ideas allowed this tide of learning to have a great breadth. Quote, they brought into their libraries everything they could lay their hands on. They were resolved to shut out nothing, unquote. Thus, as the Dark Ages began and the burgeoning Irish monastic communities began to disperse throughout continental Europe, they brought their coveted books with them. And this is another point that we touched upon, that one of the difficulties with disentangling uh, the, the, uh, the, what, what is pre-Christian, what is genuine uh, uh, indigenous lore in the written mythologies and what is influenced by that, uh, the fact uh, that uh, they brought everything into their libraries and you know they had so many uh, sources of inspiration. Uh, for their literary endeavours, uh, that, that that task of disentanglement is quite a complex one. And so I argue, for instance, and we've had this discussion on a few uh, live streams, I argue that the Dunchanicus of Douth, for instance, has many pre-Christian and indigenous aspects, but it also has the obvious Christian incursions. Uh, but uh, not getting into an anti-nativist and nativist debate tonight, it's difficult for me to perceive why considering that task is so complex. Why it would be that there are people who sit on polar sides of the fence. I mean, I'm on the fence and I'm glad to be on there, but uh, scholars uh, and, and people well-read in these things who sit on one side of the, the debate or the other, instead of having a, having a look at both sides and saying, look, it's so difficult to disentangle. How could you ever firmly place yourself on one side or the other? Many of which had been lost to continental Europe during the fall of Rome. This is the books and barbarian uh, and the Germanic pillaging sprees. Cahill argues that it was through this preservation of Western European civilization through books that the Irish essentially saved civilization. However, this argument is predicated upon a tremendous what if statement. In Cahill's words, quote, what is about to be lost in the century of barbarian invasions is literature the content of classical civilization. Had the destruction been complete, had every library been disassembled and every book burned, we might have lost Homer, 
all of classical history, Plato and Aristotle, and all Greek philosophy, we would have lost the taste and smell of a whole civilization. And of course, to an extent, we continued in that tradition because remember, for instance, the Annals of the Four Masters was compiled in the 17th century, the 1600s AD, uh, by, uh, mainly by four monks in Donegal. And uh, their sources were written sources that had been collected studiously uh, by great effort from all of the other monasteries of Ireland that had, had any surviving written records. Right? I mean, that tradition seems to have continued for a long time, you know? Kristen says, my understanding is it was the monks who were forced to retreat to islands, etc., to escape invaders and still maintain the vows. My sister did archaeology on the balance skelligs. I learned it from her. I, I, I think that's exactly the point. Burr Whelan says, hi, Anthony. Hi, hi everyone. We're all up late. Lol. Yes, indeed. Louise Sherrill says, hello, Fulge, and good night. It's late. Yeah, we're not going on for much longer, in fairness. But I had to do an episode on Thomas Cowell's book. Stay tuned for the little surprise at the end. Don't go. Definitely don't go to bed. If you go to bed, you lose out. Here we realise that Cahill is working from a grand assumption. That if it weren't for the Irish, all the books which upheld Roman and Western European culture and civilization would have been burned. Cahill fails to address the counterfactual observation. Historically speaking, we do not certainly know that all the books on continental Europe crucial to civilization were in fact burned. Therefore, it seems more appropriate to assert that the Irish played the role as preservers of Europeans' literary civilization, not saviors. Me, I think that is probably um, not so much clutching at straws as uh, making what is a kind of a rather pedantic point. But anyway, not to mention that Cahill entirely dilutes the Irish role of say, uh, in saving all of European civilization when he later states, the Hebrew Bible would have been saved without them, transmitted uh, to throughout time. I, I mean, I presume that is a typo, throughout time by scattered communities of Jews. The Greek Bible, the Greek commentaries, and much of the literature of ancient Greece were well enough preserved at Byzantium. This seems to starkly call into question the validity of his previous statement of the total loss of the content of classical civilizations. The issue, there's some quite a few typos in this, so I'm not impressed. Uh, this uh, blog could be doing with some proofreading. The issue of whether an, ent an, an entire civilization's taste and smell can be encapsulated and continued through literature is a whole other problem also not dealt with. Thus, Cahill began with a bold and grand claim that the Irish single-handedly refounded European civilization, but it seems that as one progresses through the book, the cracks and weak spots begin to shine through, with an eventual unbearable glare of suspicion developing. Is it worth continuing, or or shall we shall we progress to something uh, more mm, uh, more objective? And that seems to be very harsh. If you look at uh, how the Irish saved civilization on Amazon, it has six hundred and thirty ratings. <laughs> oh, fabulous! Uh, so, for instance, um, one one a one star reviewer says, "I'm so." I'm so glad I bought this book secondhand for very, very little, as I'm afraid it's not going to make it to my keeper shelf. I was intrigued by the title. Sadly, that was the best bit. At just over 200 pages, it's a short work, so taking about 70 pages to actually make it to Ireland from the ruins of Rome, another 30 for Patrick to put in an appearance, and the next couple of chapters to get the island converted to Christianity and the written word wading through all those Irish epics as we went, didn't leave much time to show exactly how the Irish actually managed to save civilization civilization page 145 before the author got around to telling us and even then devoted exactly one chapter to the process before bam the conclusion uh, yes uh, i was reading uh, from uh, the page starting at page 180 um so let's read a couple of one star sorry a couple of five star reviews 
Uh, fascinating read, completely entranced by this fascinating history of Irish civilization, early poets, saints, and the Irish love of literature, poetry, calligraphy, and history. The world might have stayed in the Dark Ages for a couple of more centuries had the Irish not collected and transcribed all the known works of the Romans and Greeks. Someone else uh, is writing in a language that I don't understand. Cahill's writing style is remarkable. Uh, he has a unique way of writing a chapter that contains 90% apparently unrelated information to the topic, and in the final 10% pulls it all together and it clicks. Understanding Western civilization is complicated. Cahill unravels the mystery. Also, who can resist such a provocative title? Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, so as you can see, not everybody's in love with it. Um, certainly an interesting work and an interesting thesis and worth, in my view, certainly worth having on your shelf. I think pretty much everybody uh, who has an interest in mythology, in Christianity in Ireland, in Ireland's medieval history, um, has a copy of this somewhere on their bookshelves. Whether they've read it in full or whether they love it, hate it, or sit on the fence with it, uh, it, it is a book that occupies many, many shelves. Of course, it has sold very, very well. So fair enough, you know, I don't mind that. The untold story of Ireland's heroic role from the fall of Rome to the rise of medieval Europe. Anyway, a little bit of a surprise, which is that this copy is uh, uh, the brain's just not functioning for words tonight. Surplus to requirements because uh, on Laurel and Shaw, uh, this library is uh, has enough books, and I already have a copy of. Uh, how the Irish civilized, uh, saved civilization. Now I'm going to give it away, and I think that the simplest, fairest, best way I could do it is for me to ask you, uh, when the live stream is finished, uh, to share, uh, to like the post and to share it, uh, and I will pick a winner from those who do that uh, uh, probably in about 24 hours' time. This maybe this time tomorrow night. Well, it's midnight now, of course. <laughs> I didn't realize it was so late. Um, so if you want that copy, I will uh, just ask you when this live stream is finished. Of course, on the YouTubers, um, you can't share, can you? Yeah, this is. This, I think this applies to the Facebookers only, which is kind of, I should have thought this out, shouldn't I, really? Um, but the Facebookers, if you like and share the post, when the uh, live stream is over, it will become available as a video shortly after it finishes. Uh, like and share it, uh, and um, I will put your names in a draw, and the winner will get this book posted to them. And doesn't matter where you are in the world, uh, because it'll, uh, it, I, I'm posting my own books uh, all over the world at the moment. So, uh, and they're arriving promptly. Uh, those that I sent to the States are arriving six to seven days after I send them, which is great. And on that subject, before we leave, I should mention, don't forget that Island of the Setting Sun 2020 edition. I still have a number of copies here signed by both authors, myself and Richard Moore, uh, and that can be purchased on the Mythical Ireland website. Don't forget to get your copy before I run out of copies, uh, which would be uh, a good idea, wouldn't it? Uh, can't completely guarantee uh, a getting more copies with COVID lockdown and b getting uh, them signed by both myself and Richard. I'll share that as a link also beneath uh, the video here so that you can see it. Um, there we go. And also, finally, to mention pat patron and to say thanks to wait one moment. Oh, yes, very important that I say thanks to. Uh, Shirley, uh, who became a patron last night, immediately after the uh, conclusion of episode 120 of Live Irish Myths. Thank you. And uh, if you want to become a patron of Mythical Ireland and support the work here, uh, it's patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. Just pasting that in as a link as well. You get rewards for your patronage. Early access to photos, videos, podcasts, blogs, uh, etc. And there are some very special goodies there too at certain levels. Uh, don't forget the Mythical Ireland mug and the poster and different bits and pieces like that. Anyway, that is book talk number two. Um, and I hope you enjoyed that. How the Irish Saved Civilization. If you don't win uh, the competition for this copy, uh, don't uh, worry. There are plenty of copies out there. 
And I'm always encouraging people on my live streams that if you're not a fan of Amazon, don't forget ABE books. Um, and I'm just going to search it here just briefly. And yes, there are lots and lots of secondhand copies available. So I'm not sure whether you're the sort of person who only buys new books. Uh, half of my library is made of, up of previously owned and previously used books. So I don't have a problem with it. Hopefully, uh, you will, uh, uh, well, hopefully you'll win the competition. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, we'll do lots more impromptus. Some of them will be about books, but not all of them. Uh, and don't forget, we are regularly on uh, Monday. Monday is the day now for Live Irish Myths itself. Uh, episode 120 was yesterday, uh, and we will have the next uh, uh, episode number 121 next Monday. But because we're in lockdown, it is likely that I will do more impromptu uh, live streams about various subjects. So keep prompting them, you know. I uh, hope that answers your question, Veronica. <laughs> Brilliant. I've shared it already, but I'll do it after the live has ended. I don't think it matters whether you share it while it's live or afterwards. Uh, I don't think that really matters, uh, but don't worry. Brilliant. Hope you're all keeping safe and well. Don't forget to continue to use hand sanitizer. Wash your hands. Cough and sneeze into the uh, crook of your arm. If you're outside, or don't remember social distancing and wear a mask. Keep yourselves safe uh, and sound during the ongoing ep epidemic, uh, and hopefully we'll get on top of it before too long. In the meantime, thanks for watching, and uh, I'm Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Don't know when, but we'll certainly have to talk to you tomorrow night briefly to announce the winner of Thomas Cahill's How the Irish Saved Civilization. In the meantime, it just remains for me to say, Ikawa Kolosov, August Sláin Gafol, good night, sound sleep, and goodbye for now. And of course, Tog Gubogay, take it easy. We'll see you very soon. Stay safe, everyone.